fake news, it was the, the word of the year last year, and it's a little bit like the term itself and the person who's most credited for it kind of did or had, uh, at least in my mind, the same metamorphosis. In the beginning, it was kind of like a laughable term. And we said, oh, fake news, that's bizarre. And now we feel like it's rather something threatening and it might even threat the very nature of our society. Um, I think uh, Donald Trump is often uh, accredited or credited with starting this fake news idea, but I think we don't have to look over the Atlantic. We're pretty good at producing our own fake news, um, autism and vac uh, vaccinations. I think there's something that is um, original to the UK or originated in the UK. We have the Euro bus. So what I want to say is like, I think one of the themes tonight and uh, for all the three of us is to say that fake news is not something that the other person does. It's not something that only other people do, that only Americans do. Um, no, it's you and I. We have the same, we're kind of like, um, uh, as humans prone to um, be misled by information. And I think that's a little bit the topic of the night. Of the night. And I think the interesting part about misinformation, the interesting part is not that sometimes people tell you something that is wrong, but that it persists. Take these two examples, right? They were, they were miscredited, they were debunked, they were um, debunked and debunked and debunked, and still they persist. So the persistence of misinformation is the interesting part about misinformation. It's not so much that misinformation is out there, but how does it persist? And I think if you look at these two examples, we all would agree that they still have an influence. Even though we know that they're fake, they still exert an influence. And I think that's one of the topics here. How can misinformation persist, even if it's corrected, even if it's debunked? And I think the topic, what I mentioned before, that it's just human or to human that we uh, fall prey to misinformation can also be shown that it's been around for centuries. Um, I think in a recent article it came that this might be the first uh, false or fake news misinformation war and it happened in uh, Rome a little bit before the birth of uh, Jesus Christ and this is Augustus and he was in a power struggle with Octavius, who later became Augustus. Uh, so, sorry, on the left is Mark Antonio, on the right is Octavius, who later became Augustus. And what uh, Octavius did, he kind of invented the first ancient type of tweeting. So he um, spread misinformation about Augustus. It looked a little bit like this. Uh, he would say, Mark Antonio lost Cleopatra more than Rome. Uh, real talk, Rome over Egypt. He wanted to <coughs> imply that Mark Antonio uh, loved Cleopatra more than um, he loved Rome, and hence he can't be trusted. And as a campaigner, it was very successful. Obviously, he didn't use tweets, he used coins. And he put all these messages on coins, and then distributed the coins. That's a pretty effective way of getting your message across. So this also underscores that it's been around, it's part of our human nature, it's not something we invented, it's not because of the internet, it's because of us. Um, I think we will start to talk, not I think, I will start our talks with Sisha. Sisha will talk about how uh, people process corrections of information. So uh, what happens if uh, I see a uh, correction of a misinformation? I will talk about whether reasoning is the enemy, um, a little bit about the neuroscience behind rejected unwanted information, the rejection of unwanted information. Um, and then Jens will kind of take it from the individual to the population level and look how can people uh, get and maintain wrong beliefs using a computational approach. We all have slightly different approaches, but I think you will see we have a very consistent message. Um, we want to start the, um, the evening with a little something different. Um, we talked a little bit like fake news as something maybe the stupidity of the crowds and now what we want to do is maybe something about the wisdom of the crowds. We want to play with you a little real estate game, okay? And you can do this on your phone, so if you have a laptop, you can use your laptop to do so. And I'll, let me quickly explain the game to you. So each of you get money, real money, if you win, of 10 pounds, okay? So you get 10 pounds and at the end we will pick one person 
And depending on your performance in this game, you can get up to 20 or you can lose your 10 pounds. Okay? Um, so one person we will pick and we will pay this out. So this is real money, not a lot, but it's not a bad uh, hourly wage. Um, <laughs> and so how does this uh, game work? What you will see is you will see a picture of a real estate. Something like this. This is um, around the corner here in Islington. You will see uh, uh, this kind of slightly obnoxious description from the real estate agent, what it is. And then you see a price. The price is not the real price on the listing. It's either a bit lower or a little bit higher than the actual price. And you have to guess whether you think the price is higher or lower. So is the real price higher or lower than the display price? You can do this just by answering this question. You will click higher or lower. And then after you can bet your money on it. From zero to ten. Okay. Now, in the next step, the crowd gets involved. Okay. So what you will see is you will be connected. This will take a moment, and this is the critical uh, point of this experiment. You will see we will connect it with the response of one of the people in the room. You won't know who it is. Um, there might be a real estate agent, a real estate agent among us, or it might be a person who doesn't know much, but you will not know who it is. And you will see what they thought, okay? Higher or lower? And what they thought, how much money they invested. This person thought higher um, and invested 345. And thereafter, you have a chance not to change your mind, but you have a chance to either low increase or decrease your investment. So how does it with the money work? So let's say you are right, and you bet uh, here 250. So you have an initial endowment of 10 pounds, you gain another 250, you get um, 1250 if you picked at random, right? If you're wrong and you're picked, you get 750. You get 10 minus the 250 you bet, okay? So the idea here is like if you think, if you're confident that you're right, you should bet more. If you think that you're wrong, you should kind of cut your losses and uh, uh, reduce your investment, okay? The last thing is don't put any <coughs> real names or anything in there. It's just we need to, when we pick you, we just need to know who you are. So you can enter a fictional name, you can enter your name if you don't care about that. Um, but you can say something like uh, Bodie McBoatface, and then if everyone here enters Bodie McBoatface, then we don't know who it is. So just enter a password, something like boat. Okay? And then we know that it's you. And at the end, Alois, who programmed the experiment, uh, will uh, 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 pick the winner, and I think, I don't know, yeah, during my talk, you'll know whether you uh, leave home rich or not.